Welcome to Soundbridge Music's Featured Artist Interview. In this series, we get to know front-range artists who not only shape the local music scene, but who joined with Soundbridge Music in its mission to use the power of music to improve the lives of individuals and bring communities together. We're so excited to be here today with Jessica Carson of Clandestine Amigo. Jessica creates a mix of darkly poetic R&B-inspired rock. She's a finalist in the 2019 Wildflower Art and Music Festival Songwriter Competition and an honorable mention in the 2019 Telluride Troubadour Contest. Jessica is a staple in the Front Range music community, and we're so excited she took some time to chat with us. Jessica. Yes. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. It's a pleasure to be talking to you today. Likewise. So, you are known as the mullet of the music scene, Jessica Carson of Clandestine Amigo. So how did you get that nickname? I totally made it up for promotional purposes. That Okay, well, let's talk about that. Make it up. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I was doing? So um, there's, I, I have a couple friends in marketing and, you know, had one of them look at my website and they're like, what you should do maybe that would be helpful is just come up with some small little blurbs about each band member that kind of makes it fun, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know? And so I kind of gave a couple of the Amigos some nicknames. Um, and I just, I was just trying to make it fun, you know? And I, I kind of thought of that about how, you know, I kind of do have one foot in the music world and one foot in the business world. Mm-hmm. And it made me think of a mullet. So that, I just decided that made me laugh and might make somebody else laugh. So now that, that implies <laughs> business up front and yeah, party in the back. That's right. Do you believe that that's how it's balanced in your life, though? Are you are you business up front and party in the back, that's, or do you feel like it's more party up front, business? In the no, back? it's pretty pretty business up front for me. Okay. Party in the back, yeah, yeah. Right. That's pretty true to character. So okay, and uh, I think uh, you know when I first got on the scene about uh, here in Longmont six or seven years ago, something like that. Anyway. Uh, you were already pretty well established. You'd been here uh, for a while, and you were already uh, responsible for booking uh, several of the venues around the area. Sure. Um, so, I, I mean, has that been kind of a, a a main focus of you the entire time that you've been doing music? No. I actually, you know, one thing always leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. Mm-hmm. And booking is actually... One of those things that I, um, if anybody knows anything about me, I did Prairie Scholars for 10 years. And actually, my partner at the time, Andy, did the booking in the oh, beginning. Okay. And then, uh, you know, a few a few things happened to where then I was doing the booking. And at first, I was really shy. I just hated it. I would, mm. like, sit there with my phone and just look at it and, like, have physical anxiety feeling like I cannot call a stranger and ask them to pay me money to make noise in their place Mm -hmm. and that was really really hard for me actually to begin with um so email was a great great gift for a very shy introverted person um that was just starting out and so I kind of got I kind of got the flow of that going you know started booking my own band and started enjoying it you know i've got kind of a kind of a businessy organizational mind already and so that just fit my natural skill set and then i joined the board of directors for the art walk they had just lost their music director who was putting all the music together and the reason i wanted to join was because i had learned that and um I, I love the art walk and I really wanted to see all of the music be sourced from Longmont. That mm-hmm. was like a personal goal and vision of mine. And so I joined the board and they said, oh, great, you're in music, you be the music director. And so I was like, yes, that's exactly what I wanted. Rock it on. Um, so we had three events that year and it was 10 shows per event. So it's 30 shows, shows total. And Samples World Bistro had just opened and they were part of the art walk so I booked music for them and then about a year later they were having their first anniversary and so, somehow they figured out that I'd booked the music and so they sent me an email and said hey you know we want to have music for our anniversary party 
do you do that? And I was like, I can do that. Yeah. So I, I hooked him up with somebody. I think it was the Dueling Ukes. I don't know if you remember them. But um, so I, I booked that music and they really enjoyed it. And then they got back in touch and said, hey, could you keep booking music for us? Hmm. They were, or they said, what, what are your rates? And I was like, that's always a tricky they're this. Yeah. And, you know, and they emailed me back and said, great, you know, let's do that. So I came in and started consulting with them and figured out what they wanted. But I really kind of started by accident just because the need presented itself. And then I realized that I really, really liked it. So I've done consulting with different venues. Um, I actually do the booking for some venues. I currently do Georgia Boys here in Longmont and in Frederick and the Soundpost Sessions. That is a series in the back of La Vida Bella that La Vida Bella and Dryland both sponsor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I book for... Which, by the way, I went to uh, uh, for the first time just the other night. Yeah. And it was a lovely, lovely show. And it really is just a, a, a fantastic space and... Uh, the sound quality is amazing, and it's just a really intimate space. It's, I mean, yeah. thank you I'm for glad getting you enjoyed that. It. <laughs> that um, Tim Golsrud actually does the sound and stage mm -hmm. production for that, and um, I started working with him because I uh, one was one of the original co-founders for Winter Walkabout Music Showcase, mm -hmm. and we did the first show in La Vida Bella. Where, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Should we pause? Actually, it looks like it was a like a package being delivered. The guy walked away. Okay. So. Oh, that's cool. Lovely. And okay. that's all good. Well, I winter walkabout, I think, is where so we stopped. So. We did the first show um, in, in that space. It's called the Renaissance Room. Mm -hmm. And kind of another one of those things where one thing leads to another. I went to a little Christmas party of Giselle, my singer in my band, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and her boyfriend, Brett, who's a sound engineer, and I met Tim. And he was talking about wanting to do shows back there. And I was like, we're looking for a place for an after party. You think you want to do that? He's like, yeah, we'd love to do it. So um, we ended up working together on that and found that we really enjoyed working together. And he wanted to start the series. So we talked a bit about it. And um, at first, I just provided with him with some ideas of maybe who to book and like who to pair together. Mm -hmm. And then... Over time, it was kind of like, okay, I'll book it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'll do it. Let's do it. So, yeah. Oh, that's it. So, pretty organically, they just sort of picked up that way. That's yeah. fantastic. I find that my favorite projects and the most successful ones just kind of like come to me, and I don't really have to force them. That's that's really interesting. Now, now, do you find that with your... Um, I mean, we, we've been talking about the booking uh, process, but when we're... Talking about the creative process, when you have your uh, clandestine amigo as your your current uh, main main gig, mm -hmm. um, how, did that come pretty organically for you? It did. Mm. So um, when I was doing the Prairie Scholar still, that was kind of a country folk kind of vibe. Mm -hmm. West Texas soul music is what we called it, and I had um, a good collection of songs that really didn't fit that genre. That felt a little more like. R&B kind of soulful, kind of almost funk, you know, with full band. I, I really love soul, funk, R&B, rock music. Um, and so I had a handful of songs that I really wanted to play out, you know. And so I decided to just be brave and book myself some solo shows. So I did that. And in the meantime, um, was co-hosting the open mic at Sky Brewing, mm -hmm. which is no longer with us, but oh, it was yeah. great, mem you know, like great memories from it. Hey, rest in peace. Yeah, <laughs> rest in peace. Um, and I had met Michael Wooten, drummer, and he had learned somehow that I had booked myself a show for my birthday. And he said, hey, do you want some company? And I was like, yeah, that might be fun. You know, we just jammed together at the open mic but never rehearsed and mm -hmm. so we didn't rehearse the songs he just showed up and uh man we we played and I felt like we'd been playing together for five or six years or something and he just he just really picked up on the nuances and watched my body language for the stops and it's like man well that was kind of magical how did you do that and then uh -huh. I, I learned about his background you know he's like well yeah. I toured with Carol King and I just really feel piano enough uh -huh. of course uh -huh. but that you know, him 
um, asking if he could play with me and then following up and saying, hey, are you going to book us another gig? You know, it first started out as Jessica Epler at the time and Michael Wooten. And that, that's what the poster said, you know. There was no clandestine amigo. And um, over, over time, it just he kind of gave me the courage and helped me find the courage in myself to play those songs that, um, you know, it's, it's such a different vibe when it's just like your project. If you're sharing it with someone else and you're collaborating, you don't have to like take the responsibility for people loving it or hating it. You know? <laughs> but he really helped me find the courage and was an essential part. If he hadn't come along and, you know, asked if I wanted to play, there probably wouldn't be a clandestine amigo. Let me let me ask you about the name yes. Clandestine Amigo. That is such an awesome name. Uh, I thanks. love that. How did you come up with that? Um, I give people a lot of bullshit answers, but the, I'll <laughs> but give you're gonna you give the me truth. the real one. I'm gonna give you the truth today. Okay. So that was the name of my band um, right out of college. I was oh. probably 19 or 20, mm -hmm. and my husband at the time, who's my ex now had written a song that had a phrase that said clandestine amigo or the Texas way was clandestine amigo. Mm. And I just loved that phrase. And just those two words together made me feel something. Mm -hmm. And so I named my band that as kind of a nod to him. And then when I decided, you know, Kyle, uh, fast forward 10 or 12 years or however long it's been. Sure, 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 sure. Um, you know, Mike Wooten and I had started playing together and then Kyle Donovan, who was living in Denver at the time, um, he, we actually met because he sent me a booking email to play at Samples, which mm -hmm. I was booking. And I checked out his website and thought he was great, invited him to the open mic and he came and we became very fast friends. And uh, he was just kind of like, hey, if you ever want a guitar player, just play around. It's like, okay. So I took him up on that, and then once it became a trio, I decided, all right, I'm going to do this again. You know, I want to have my band back. So um, I brought back the old name, which I don't think I'd really, I don't think I ever really let that go. I was always a little bit sorry to leave my band. Mm, yeah. So it's kind of a resurrection of, of that. Oh, well, that's fantastic. So that's the true story. I give people a lot of stupid answers. What are though. some of the stupid answers? Um, I tell them it's because I'm shy. I tell them it's because I have a clandestine amigo. And like an imaginary that, friend? Or that, no, no, no. <laughs> that like oh, Giselle is my clandestine amigo, oh, like my okay. secret friend, you know? Got it, got it, got it. So I give them a lot of, I give a lot of stupid answers, but that's the truth. Cool. All right. Well, so, um, you were a finalist. Let me see if I can find it here. Sorry. Um. For the Wildflower Art and Music. That's right. You were a finalist for the <laughs> Wildfire, the, 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 the Al Johnson songwriter yeah. competition. And the song was Enough. And uh, I guess the uh, first question is, what was it like to be a finalist in that competition? It was an interesting experience. So I um, actually had two songs, Enough and Either Way. Um, and, you know, I haven't done anything competitive like that in mm -hmm. quite a long time. Um It's, it's almost hard to even, there's so much to it. So I did that just kind of on a whim. I'd never applied to any songwriter competitions before. And I just thought like, I don't know, I'm doing a lot of new stuff in my life. So let's do it. Um, and then I made the finals and with, I don't know, that in itself to me was like, I got picked like top 10 out of 200 people. I feel like I already won. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah. And so I kind of went down there, no expectations, and it, it ended up being a lot of fun. So I drove down there with Kyle because he had been in it the year before and had won People's Choice and made a great impression. And he actually ran the sound for the songwriter stage. Oh, wow. Okay. So that was cool. He and Daniel Herman, um, I don't know if you know him. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, so they ran the sound. So just getting to drive down there together and have the experience of, of like... 14 hour car ride bonding was <laughs> super fun. Um, I saw my parents, I saw my brother and sister in law. Um, meeting the other finalists was really cool. Uh, a lot of very down to earth people. Now, I, I don't know that we, 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 we said this explicitly, uh, but you're from Texas. Yeah. So, um, and I found that you had. 
you went to South Plains College for music, commercial music. True. Was that in, is that also from in Texas? That is in Leveland, Texas, kind of oh. West Texas Panhandle okay. area. Well, I was, uh, so I was kind of curious. Um, uh, you know, I think a lot of musicians when they're they're up and coming have questions about you know should you know I get educated in music or should I just jump into it? And what was the value that you found in taking uh, a formal uh, music uh, education? Um, first, I want to say there's not a wrong answer to that question. Like, okay. yes, you should get educated, and yes, you should just go ahead and jump in. Like, however you want to do it, you're going to learn along the way. And just because you don't have a degree, you know, you're going to gain a lot of experience just doing it. Um, that being said, I did learn some things doing that program that I found to be very beneficial. Um, especially the there are particular professors that I got to take from that really I learned a lot from hmm. and I've kept in touch with them. Um, but specifically the the business and promotion class really gave me a lot to think about, you know, being a being a teenager when I went I wasn't thinking about contracts and hmm. um, getting press packs together and websites and I just wanted to write my songs and yeah. whatever that means. <laughs> you know? But there really is a whole other world to think about. Um, and I kind of gravitate towards that. I like the ins and outs of it. I like the organization. Um, one of my professors, Scott Ferris, uh, he really took the time to go through things with me like what kind of information do you need to keep for bookkeeping and and how do you do taxes at the end of the year and that sort of thing um i did also take voice and piano and like songwriting and we had ensembles which were really cool because it was uh they were based off of genre so you could you could have like a country swing ensemble or a jazz ensemble or a rock ensemble so it was really applicable information for when you go off and try and be in a band how are you going to work with people mm -hmm. so yeah i mean i learned quite a bit there and made friends or at least made some connections that later turned into friendships um bonnie and taylor sims mm -hmm. we were there at the same time oh okay um there's a guy named Tyler Thompson or Tyler T that is out of Fort Collins. Hmm. Um, and we were there at the same time. Um, just this past weekend, the song post sessions that you came to, uh -huh. Zach Balch, um, he was one of my best friends during that time. So, I, I mean, you've turned out to be a real connection here with, uh, I mean, the Texas, kind of, it seems like, I mean, with these other Texas folks, I mean, th those folks were just traveling. The, uh, mm -hmm. the what was the Lake name? Lake Creek family. Yeah. yeah. They were just passing through, but mm -hmm. um, but they said they were even thinking about moving out here. Yeah. And you, there, like you mentioned, there are some other folks that came up from Texas. Was there kind of like a big uh, movement uh, from Texas up here from people that you knew? Or um, is that just all just sheer happenstance? You know, Bonnie and Taylor were up here before I was mm -hmm. by, I don't know. A few years because Taylor did Spring Creek Bluegrass Band and they were up here in Colorado before Bonnie and the Clydes um, and then I think Tyler T maybe came around the same time but it wasn't anything like we talked about it um, we just all figured out it was awesome and then we should <laughs> live here um, but as far as uh, like the Flint Creek family uh, we actually reconnected when I went down for the the wildflower oh, okay. thing in Richardson, Texas. Um, so that was really the win that I felt like I got was reconnecting with my friend. Yeah. Um, and then I just randomly called him up one day and he said they were going to be up here for a wedding, um, which was this past Saturday. And I had the day open before that. So I felt like it would be a really good time. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Well, so uh, d now I... Uh... I guess it's been a while since you've been completely immersed in the Texas scene. Yeah. But what, do you, how do you feel like the Texas scene uh, compares with what's going on here and you know, along the Front Range? Um, I think it probably depends on what part of Texas you're looking at. So, like, Austin, mm -hmm. Well, everybody knows about the Austin sure, scene, sure. right? Um, Lubbock, though, that's a very different scene. Um, it's about... I'm going to say 30 or 45 minutes from the college I went to. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but it's mostly college town. It's like late night, the gigs are 10 to 2 in the morning kind of deal. Um, a lot of a lot of cover bands, lots of country, you know, as far as singer songwriter, there are a few names that kind of rise to the top and people know about, but um, not like you find so many singer songwriters here, you know. Is, uh, You're a singer songwriter. I'm a singer songwriter. She's a singer songwriter. <laughs> well, it, does, does it seem to you? I, it, it strikes me. I, I, I guess when I when I first started uh, doing the music thing, uh, which was pretty late in life, um, I started out in Portland, mm. Oregon, and it seemed like they had a really thriving uh, music scene for uh, for original music. And then I came back here, and I found that it, I mean, I only spent a year out there after living here for like twenty years, and then came back. And uh, they also found there was also a thriving scene for original music here. And I, I'm curious, do you, do you think, it, it, I have a theory that that has to do with the whole craft brewery scene. Mm. Because that's in Portland as well as it is out here in the, in the Denver metropolitan area. Um, do you have any insights? Is it any reason? But, I, you know, I talk to people, say, in the Washington, D.C. area, and it doesn't seem to be anywhere near as big mm -hmm. for, like, singer-songwriters at least. Um, do you have any sense as to why you think it might be bigger out here than it is in other places in the country? Um, I mean, I don't have any graphs or like measured arguments for it. We're, we're looking for visual, <laughs> we're looking for visual supplements. Did, did, didn't you just tell her here's, to bring some, some charts and here's graphs? Here's graph. the okay. Here's the growth of the singer song right now. Um, I'm glad that's all that was on the graph. I was thinking you were giving me something obscene. <laughs> no, that's a, no, no, okay. no. It just seems like a family-friendly show, you know. <laughs> I said bullshit earlier and immediately felt a little bit guilty. Are we going to bleep that out? That's a... Did you actually say bullshit earlier? I think I did. Was it bullshit? Okay. Oh, my God. Oh. This is... <laughs> Getting rowdy okay. on a Monday afternoon. Okay, so it's... Um, no, I, I have talked to a few people about this, though, and it does seem like there's a craft culture going on um it's the craft beer it's the you know distilleries cideries the farm to table food um the people making amazing visual art um and and the music you know i think there's just something about the culture where people really appreciate things that are made here mm. there's like a almost like a cultural confidence of like oh you you can be from here and be awesome and we totally believe you whereas sometimes it feels like in texas you have to go somewhere else and make it and mm -hmm. like gain gain some respect and earn a name sure and then you can come back and they'll respect you, huh. <laughs> you know I mean? i'm not really sure that that's 100 percent true that's just been my feeling and experience on it i that that that, that jives with some of the other folks i've talked to yeah with too so that's yeah, that's just an interesting, interesting question there. So yeah, it's a cool place we live. Yeah, I think so. I think we are. This is this is turning out to be a pretty unique uh, place to do music. So, yeah. um, let's see here. You are the program director for the Longmont Area Chamber of Commerce. True. So how does uh, how does that play out, and how does that mix with your uh, your musical ventures? Um, so I guess it's been. About a year and a half, maybe a little more at this point, that I started at the Chamber. Um, I started for a few reasons. I was having a lot of life changes. The Prairie Scholars was coming to an end. Um, to be 100% honest, I wasn't sure I wanted to do music anymore. Mm. Um, looking back, this past year, year and a half, is the first time I feel like I've really chosen it for myself. 100%. Um, my mom is a piano teacher. You know, I grew up playing piano. When it was time to go to college, I was interested to go for psychology to be a counselor to help people in some way. And my parents really encouraged me to go for music. And so I did. Um, fell in love very quickly. You know, got married. Um, and then moved up here. Um, I feel like it's really easy for me to fall into a supporting role. Um, that's something that I enjoy and mm -hmm. it tends to come naturally for me. And so, um, being back then, you know, in my early twenties, being kind of shy and unsure of myself and introverted, um, it was easier for me to tell myself that I was 
pushing my project forward because I believed in my partner's music, but mm-hmm. not because I believed in mine. So I've, I've can see, you know, hindsight 2020, but I can see that I've kind of hidden a bit, you know, hidden behind other people. So I didn't have to take the brunt of things or didn't have to be completely responsible for failure or success. Um, and so I started at the chamber thinking, I don't even know if I want to do music anymore. Mm. Like, I want to write songs, but I don't have to share them with anybody. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. I don't have to, I don't have to try and run the race and I don't have to do any of that stuff. And when I took that step back and stopped relying on music financially to pay my rent and really pushing for a career in that, it seemed like I finally was able to relax and just see that like, yes, I actually really, really do love music and I do want to have um, involvement in the music scene, but it maybe doesn't look like what I was doing even three years ago. Mm -hmm. It's going to look a little more diverse. So I don't, I don't want the pressure of having to write new songs so I can put out a new album, so I can sell copies, so I can Uh keep living and eating food. I don't want that kind of pressure. I want to write songs when I feel like I have something to share and to say and to process. Um, And I want to play the gigs that really make me feel like yes, and not play like a bowling alley at 10 at night in Fort Collins for nobody. You know what I mean? Well, I know I know exactly what you mean because that's a you know it, it's an interesting compromise because I, I think that uh, I mean uh, musicians they want to go full time sure they want to be full time artists yeah is what they think is going to happen yeah but the the business side becomes a lot more dominant than I think a lot of people expect and it's it's funny because I, I I keep a part time job uh, while I'm doing the music and I find. That I, I feel like that gives me a lot of freedom. I don't have to maybe do as many covers like right. at, a, yeah. at a show. It, you know, I can do all originals, and and I don't feel like I have to compromise that way. Yeah. Um, but then there's you know, but I know there's some people that feel like, well, if you have that part time job, you know, you're just you're not being completely hundred percent true to the artistic nature of it. So I I, I totally respect both sides of that. Mm-hmm. Um, for me personally. Um, just doing music, like just performing was unfulfilling. Mm-hmm. I didn't feel like I was tapping into, um, I suppose my fully actualized self because I do have all these other skills and I, I do have all these other things that I like to do and I wasn't fulfilling those. Sure. I was only doing one thing. Mm-hmm. So I still do that one thing. But I round it out with things like program director at the chamber, which um, that's a lot of um, working with people directly, working with groups of people, organizing events, um, just kind of the working with group dynamics and and, um, finding a way that when opinions differ and people want different things, how do we come to a compromise? How do we get along? Those are things, and and wanting to go to school for psychology, it's like I can kind of play out like helping people and working with with those dynamics without having to get a degree or like anything super important like a marriage or something hinging on my support or opinion. (laughs) Sure, sure. Um, So it's been interesting since I've been there, and um, my coworkers are very supportive of my music. My boss is awesome, and like kind of brags on me and makes me feel shy and like <laughs> when people come and he's like, Oh, have you met Jessica? Yeah, yeah, she does all this music stuff. And so, um, people have started to find out that I do music. And so I'll get like a random email from a chamber member uh-huh. about, Hey, we're doing a retirement party. Do you have such and such band that you could recommend? And so I'm able to make those connections with my music world and my business world and kind of help a little bit of both at the same time. Oh, yeah. very cool. Yeah. Now, are, are are there any concerns about conflict of interest at all, or what, how do you, or and how do you handle those if there are? Um, that hasn't come up yet. Maybe it will in the future. Um, but I think as far as my, as far as my boss, he's really open about like 
we all have lives other than the chamber Mm -hmm. and really gives us the freedom to experience those lives and not have to be a completely separate person. Um, He actually encouraged me to put my music business cards in the little visitor center, even though I'm not a member and that's for members only. He's like, well, you work here. You know, you I'm gonna get a ask free my boss if I can do that now. That's a great idea. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then a couple of my colleagues um, are very, very involved at Tinker Mill and do mm-hmm. a lot there. And you know, I hear throughout the week uh, things about what's happening at Tinker Mill and, mm-hmm. and the dynamics over there and their events and that kind of thing. So everybody has something else going on, but they're really open about just embracing it and you know it's all part of the community what's happening that's great that's great they, it's great that they have that kind of atti- attitude yeah um well, let's see here uh okay i joked about asking you this question the other night when, <laughs> at the sound sound post sessions but uh i'm gonna ask you anyway you don't have to answer you don't have to answer John. but what was your drunkest performance i first i want to preface this with saying i almost never drink anymore I went through a phase of like gigging probably four, sometimes five times a week or more. Mm. And all of those places are restaurants, breweries, places with alcohol. And then, you know, as the, as the staff kind of gets to know you, you show up and they have your thing poured for you. you Oh yeah. yeah. Um, but I'll, I'll go ahead and say it. The lion's fork. That was like. The most I think I've ever indulged and felt like I needed to sit down. Right. Lions Fork. If you ever need a great place to go. <laughs> there you go. All right. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, I was also fishing around for questions from uh, from the audience. Uh, people that oh. Know. Oh, and, boy. And uh, one fella said that I should ask you about uh, Pity Party. <laughs> Is that yes. something you want to talk about? <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. I try to mostly be an open book. So, um, that question definitely came from Mark Venezia from Wind Over the Earth, because that's going to be the name of our album together. Oh, okay. But (laughs) we were joking, um, as we do, about how, like, when I got divorced and I moved out, um, I didn't take a lot of stuff. And I was like, I should have made a divorce registry. You know how people like make oh, sure. registries for uh-huh. their for their wedding. Makes I was like, I should have made yeah. a divorce registry because now I'm having to like rebuy all this stuff. <laughs> 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 and um, then we talked about having, uh, you know, how people have bridal showers. We could have a divorce registry that then like they bring the gifts to the pity party, and so that's that's where that came from. Very oh, very cool. Okay, Mark's great fun. We have a great time. Too. <laughs> Um, let's, let's talk about songwriting a little bit here. Okay. Um, so you, you have a full band mm-hmm. and you've, uh, seems like you, you were, when you were the Prairie Scholars, you had an ensemble and, uh, well, I, I guess, I guess the question I have is, uh, when you're writing a song and you know that you've got a full band, uh, that can interpret it with you, uh, do you find yourself writing differently, uh, in, in those circumstances? I don't actually mm-hmm. no I think um, probably because of the way the band formed um, I told you about Mike and Kyle how they both were kind of mm-hmm. like do you mm-hmm. want to um, and then Jeff Cloud came along and said hey if you ever want a bass player I was like okay hear the songs you know and he learned <laughs> them and Giselle and I had been good friends and and she had uh, fronted a band called Idlewild and then took a little break from music and want to get back into it. I was like, I'd love to just sing. I was like, here are these songs. <laughs> come come sing if you want and don't if you don't want. And so um, I think because of the way the band was formed, they kind of found their parts around what was already there. Mm-hmm. So no, the short answer is no. I don't think about that in the writing process. However, afterwards when we're actually playing the songs together i may alter what i'm playing on the piano mm-hmm. to leave space for the other instruments um because 
a piano is like having a little orchestra at your fingertips. You know, you can absolutely got so many things that you can push all at one time and make so many sounds. And I really enjoy when I was growing up, I liked things like ragtime and classical music and things that have a lot happening that sure. really fill out the piece on just the piano. So when I do play with other people, I tend to simplify a little bit to leave space. I, yeah, I, I do the same thing with guitar arrangements. I find yeah. like the, uh, I'm really fond of, I don't, it seems like I, I write a lot of songs with thumb bass. Oh. And my most frequent collaborator is, is uh, Jay Allen. My, he plays a stand-up bass. And so when I get there, it's like I've already taken up the bass line. And so he's, you know, we have to figure <laughs> out, what are, are you going to take what I've been doing or are you going to come up with something? It's an interesting... But yeah, it be, you know, being able to change it up and adapt it is, that's, uh, I, I like that. I like that. So. Yeah. Um, okay, so now you're primarily a keyboardist. However... You are also, a, well, this is technically a keyboard, I guess, as well, but you're an accordion player as well. And that's a fairly, that's a more recent... Uh, that's pretty recent. Yeah. How's yeah. that? How does that compare to playing the, the keyboard? I have so much fun with it. Um, it kind of puts my, my music theory brain into practice because of the way that the buttons are laid out on mm -hmm. the left side. So the keyboard's the same, you know, same, same patterns. Keys are a little smaller, so your muscle memory kind of has to adjust. Sure. But on the left side, the buttons are laid out in the circle of fifths, like oh, yeah, okay. going up. If you're going up the buttons, circle of fifths, you mm -hmm. know, and if you're going down, of course, they're in fourths, of course. Um, but mostly I do that for fun. Like, I don't think I'm amazing. I feel like I could back people up and do just like some simple stuff. Mm -hmm. But that's not something that I've put a ton of time in. Mostly it's just... So you don't whip it out very often at your shows, or not at my shows, no. Mm -hmm. um, and I moved three times in the last year and a half, mm -hmm. and I think in the in the moving, it's just kind of like stuff gets shoved in a corner, and then you forget about it. And then when I I bought a house in July and and picked it back up, I was like, oh yeah. I have this <laughs> so um, I'll probably I'll probably get into it a little more now that I have my own place and oh, yeah. it's it's loud you know oh yeah I bet it's yeah. loud yeah yeah, yeah. It's, well, it's like it's like bagpipes with a keyboard on it right kind of. isn't that how it is I mean that's a... it kind of is it's loud and droney <laughs> have you ever um, heard that guy that does bagpipes outside of the library yeah yeah that's crazy stuff it's kind of ironic being right by the library well um, okay, I, I have a, I want to delve a little bit into um, the Prairie Scholars a little bit more, because okay. you, you guys were kind of a power couple, uh, you and Andy Epler were a power couple for a long time. Um, You're making me nervous. The, no, 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 it's not, 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 not nothing, nothing, nothing seriously <laughs> uh, gotcha or anything like that. Okay. But what, what, I mean, what were the, what were the pros and cons of just kind of mixing art, business, and, and romance? Because uh, I, I think... There are a lot of, you know, I, I think a question for me is always like, well, do I want to date somebody in the same music scene? Do I want to, I mean, because that, I, I could see the, the pros of that. You know, you got somebody who's keeping kind of a similar schedule to you. You both have the same goals. You understand what you're trying to do. You understand each other in a way that, you know, trying to date somebody outside of the, the music world may not. Um, but at the same time, it's you know maybe it's competitive. Maybe you know I, I'm just curious. What 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 do you what did you find to be the ins and outs of, of that kind of thing? And, and what are there any any advice you give to folks that are looking at getting into relationships with other artists? There's a lot to unpack there. Yeah. We'll see. Um, I mean, there are definitely both pros and cons. Some of the pros are. Um, it seems like people have to work so much these days that working in the same project as a spouse or a partner, um, you're going to see them a lot, mm -hmm. which not everybody gets to have, you know, with their significant other. Um, so that's a pro. And I mean, I think something you might just keep in mind is the dynamics of your relationship outside of music or business or any of those things, those dynamics will carry over. They just will. So 
whoever seems to take more of a leadership role between the two of you, they're probably going to be that same way in business Mm -hmm. or in music. Um, I would say as far as like the creative part of it and like writing and, and making the music, um, that can be a really cool thing. Like if you're with a person that you really trust and they support you and you can trust them to be honest with you and tell you whether they like something or not really, or, um, and do it in a gentle way Mm -hmm. that is going to, um, not feel like a slap in the face, but just feel like an honest feedback with no emotional, emotional ramifications. Um, that's a super important thing. Mm -hmm. I think you can probably learn, um, quite a bit very quickly in working with another person musically that you're also in a relationship with. Um, I'll tell you who some, somebody that does it really, really well because I lived with them for a year and I got to see it up close is Bonnie and Taylor Sims. Mm. Those guys, <laughs> I just, they work really well together. I just objectively, I saw that, yes, they have Bonnie and the Clydes, but Taylor goes and sits in with other bands and Bonnie goes and does um, songwriter in the round or you know they they have separate things that they do and they encourage each other and they're proud of each other there's not jealousy you know it's um a really cool dynamic to see um and then when things get you know tense they're good at like they, they fight well you know <laughs> yeah, i think they're they're so not that, you know i don't think they would mind me saying that but like they resolve things well and um you know at the end of the day they're really really on each other's side they're really on each other's team no matter what and so man i think it's a cool thing to experience um and i think it's maybe better for some people than others i'm i'm finding for myself that i'm kind of enjoying um having like musical partners and then having business partners Mm -hmm. and having a, an at home partner and like having lots of different people that I do things with. And it's not just one person for everything. Sure. Sure. You know, I think it's for me personally, it's probably good to have lots of different personalities and different kinds of people that I do different things with. Um, Tell us about your relationship with Soundbridge music. And, uh, and its mission. Um, I'm pretty new to Soundbridge. I mean, I know Trish and Wes and Tim and Antonio are b- both on the board. Um, Tim Ostick and Antonio Lopez, for those of you that don't know for some reason. Um, I've known that it exists, but I, um, I mostly, you know, if an opportunity comes up, like I... Th- I remember one time Butch Hancock from Texas was touring through and he was looking for a house show. And I thought, well, Trish does house shows. Maybe she'll do it. So I kind of pitched him over to Trish and they did a house show and it was awesome. And um, I think everybody had a good time and he was happy to have an audience up here. Um, Other things like the Soundbridge Music Mixers, which I think are super cool. The first, no, last Sunday of every month at 300 Suns, two to four. Um, that is something that I feel like if I really want to see it keep going. Yeah, you know? me too. Me too. I think those are really cool and it provides an opportunity to learn from people you know, but also um, Trish has been cool enough to let me say like, hey, this person from Texas is coming up for a show. Would you be interested in having them for a mixer and like hearing what she's super receptive about that and has booked a couple of my Texas friends for the musician mixers. Um, and it's been cool for me to just get to see them, um, in that kind of setting and, and get to hear what they know. Yeah. There's a lot of valuable information that all of us have. Um, I did one on booking and I ended up asking questions to some of the people yeah. that were there. Cause I mean, we've all had different experiences and just because one thing worked for me, doesn't mean it's going to work for you. And I'd like to hear about what you did that worked. So I see it as um, kind of an up and coming organization that could really connect some dots and like help build the community 
around. So I'm excited you guys are here right. doing shows and, and podcasts and all sorts of stuff. Indeed. Mixers. Indeed. Yeah. Yeah, I love those mixers. I'm bummed that I missed the one yesterday. I thought that looked it really good. It was good. I don't want to rub it in. But <laughs> I learned a lot. <laughs> well, so just uh, just in a more broader sense, uh, uh, a more broader sense. A more sense. broader sense. Not just broader. Yeah. More broader. A more broad than broad. <laughs> uh, where would you like to see the music community uh, here, the local music community in about five years? Um, I'd like to see it become more sustainable. Mm -hmm. I'd like to see more infrastructure in place for the local music community. What does that look like? So to me, one of the things that I've experienced doing music full time is that you have a very limited budget. And um, the way that housing prices are rising all the time, yeah. the difficulty surrounding health insurance, um, just the cost of living in general, I think is really, really difficult for people that don't have like a steady nine to five, always know where your work is, know exactly when you're going to get paid health insurance, some kind of benefits, you know, some kind of IRA planning for the future, 401k, like the grown up stuff. Yeah. Uh, artists and musicians, one, I found very commonly don't think about that stuff for themselves. Um, and two, even if they did think about it, what are they going to do about it? Yeah. They're just going to pay for health insurance out of pocket or find a place that they can afford. So what I would really like to see is, um, I see that Longmont embraces its craft culture, its creative community, and I would like to see them make some move them, you know, us, all of us, make some moves to show that we value that and make some moves to put infrastructure in place maybe specified affordable housing for the creative community mm -hmm. artists and musicians that are doing it full-time busting their asses and can barely afford to live where they live or they live in some place that isn't really conducive to what they need to do sure um i would like to see some kind of health care plan whether it's like a group health insurance that we can all figure out how to do or a fund that we can tap into when we need it, some kind of plan. Um, and I know that those are lofty things. <laughs> to, it's like a really heavy wish list, like, dear Santa, healthcare for all, you know. Um, but I think that if we, as a community, really do value um, creative energy and um, original music and art that is made here, then we'll financially support it. Well, it seems like, uh, I mean, with like health insurance in particular, you'd think that you might have a pool large enough if you were to bring together all the uh, the homegrown stuff, I guess, mm -hmm. which is the, the original music, the original uh, brewing, the original uh, food, all, all that stuff. It's all, it all shares that commonality. Mm -hmm. And if that's why the music scene is, the original music scene is so thriving here, then maybe there, maybe there is a way to team up on that. I uh, yeah, yeah. I like I like it. I know that's lofty, but in my mind, um, I moved here ten years ago, and people, um, a lot of artists and musicians that I met during that time, um, they were people that just moved here or had been here for a couple years, um, and they, you know, one of the sentiments that I heard over and over was, oh yeah, I wanted to move to Boulder, but it's way too expensive. Yeah. And so I feel like because of the way Boulder is set up, um, it really couldn't take in more artists and musicians. They can't afford to live there. Yeah. And so we got a really large influx of this creative culture that I'd really like to see us keep because I think people value it. But if we don't do anything about it, those same people are going to have to move somewhere else because couldn't afford to live in Longmont. Yeah. So I'd really like to see us keep our culture that has been cultivated here in this city. Well, I know uh, in Loveland they have the art space mm -hmm. uh, program, and they have something. I'm not sure if they have art space down in Denver, but they have something de similar to that. And yeah, it would be neat if we could get something like that here in, in Longmont or yeah. or in Boulder County. Mm -hmm. 
I think enough people care. I think that so. If a few people push the issue, I think it could happen. Yeah. yeah. All right. Start uh, pushing the issue. Push the issue. You're all artists out there. Let's work yeah. together. I don't mind being one of those people pushing the issue. <laughs> touched on this a little bit, but what advice would you give to musicians just entering the local scene? Know yourself and know what you want. And take time to figure that out. You know? Yeah, yeah. Because I think if you don't if you don't know your goals, it's going to be shotgun style just like, okay, maybe I'll, maybe I'll tour. And you go on a couple weeks tour and then you come back and go, God, that was exhausting and I made no money. You know? (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Like, well, why did you tour? I don't know, because people tour. You know? Like, really know what you want and why. And if you need to take a year to figure that out, so be it. But I think unless your goals and what it is that you want, if those things aren't clear to you, you're going to just be taking stabs in the dark forever. Mm. Um. And also, appreciate the process of making the music and focus less on where it might get you and mm-hmm. what it might get you. Mm-hmm. Like, do it because you love it. Um, something that I feel like I've learned firsthand is people feel the intention of songs. People feel the intention that, is, that art is created with, that songs are written with. People feel that. Whether it's like, whether they're aware of it or it's subconscious, the message comes across. And so for me, when I stopped writing songs, hoping someone would like it or hoping that it would be good enough that people would want to buy it, and I gave up the intention of doing it for someone else, and I started just writing songs for just the simple fact of needing to express something that was inside, you know, I have, you know, all these things that I've been thinking about or life experiences that I've gone through or maybe joy that I've experienced, pain that I've experienced, um, something that I needed to express when I am true to that and I do it honestly, not thinking who might hear it, if anybody will ever hear it. Those are the songs that when people do hear them, they get the best connection. You know, someone will come up to me, God, this song really made me feel something. And I think it's because like, like I was saying, I mean, art and and music, it's like a little time capsule and you, you put all these things into the capsule and you close it up. And every time you sing it, you crack it back open and you experience a little bit of that and the people that hear it experience your feelings and your emotion and your intention that you put into it every time. So be intentional. Don't just, (laughs) I mean, it's, I think like writing songs for practice is good and, and that kind of thing. But for me, expression of something that I need to get out of my system, like pull the, I've used this scenario before, but it's like pulling this taffy, out of your throat <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> like you need to get it out and and use your mm-hmm. voice to get it out and then you feel better yeah. I feel better yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah. be intentional set goals be clear be honest with yourself those be, are the bullet for be bullet honest points. with That's yourself right. is probably the biggest one I like that. don't bullshit yourself um all right, so what uh, what do you want to achieve next in your music career? That's a great question. <laughs> well, um, right now, I'm in the midst of working on an album. It's a project that I just kind of stumbled into by going with the flow and another one of those organic things that, like, I just happened to go to the right coffee shop on the right day at the right time. And now I'm doing a recording project with a (laughs) company called PS Audio in Boulder. Mm -hmm. And when I started it, I felt really unsure of it because Michael Wooten, my drummer, Mm -hmm. had shoulder replacement surgery. He can't play on it. Um, Kyle Donovan, my guitar player, 
his dad had a really bad health scare and um, there was no way I was going to be like, can I have like 20 hours of your time per week for a few weeks? <laughs> you know what I mean? So I went into the project wanting to just keep it simple. Um, and so it's myself and Giselle Collazo, um, who sings background. And I just thought, well, I'll just keep it simple. I'll just be piano and the vocals. Um, but it turns out the company really liked it. And the, the owner of the company heard it. I was like, all right, we got to, we got to make this a thing. I'm like, okay. So I've been putting some other instruments on it, some strings, a little bass. Um, we did a horn section on one song. That's wow. pretty sweet. Cool. So I guess my next goal is finalizing that and then kind of seeing what happens with that. You know, I don't really have expectations because I've never done anything like this mm -hmm. um, with a company that wants to market it to their audience and kind of do the heavy lifting of That's, promotion. Yeah. They're like, yeah, you write the songs and you sing them and play them and then just, just, you just wait right there. <laughs> like, okay, cool. So I kind of want to just give that some time and space to do its thing and whatever happens with that will happen with that. Um, since Mike did have shoulder replacement surgery, we've been putting a lot of good vibes and love towards him and he's been healing and... Um, getting great reports from the physical therapy mm. and doing well. So we have our first show back as a full band this month. No, October. Yeah, October uh, 24th at Nisi's is our first full band show back. Excellent. So I think just like getting everybody back together. You know, Kyle's dad is doing great. And so he's, he's back at it. And so I think just like gathering everyone back together and, and reassessing, you know. Getting the band back together. Yeah. That's... Yeah. We didn't really break up or anything like that. I know, that, but still. But it it's, was like, it's like coming back before. after summer break or something. But it was a little exactly. bit. Exactly. With a, a little bit more uh, turmoil. Though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry, that's yeah. Exactly. Maybe not the best analogy. So. It was kind of a summer break. But the, the point yeah. is that it's kind of a triumphant. It's, it probably it feels kind of like a triumphant. Break. Yes, it does. Yeah. Because there was a lot of uncertainty there for a while. Yeah, yeah. Not knowing how surgery would go or yeah. what would happen with Kyle's dad, Tim. And. Um, so knowing that everybody's healthy and on a good track and recovering is a relief. Um, I've, it's funny now that I've started recording a batch of my newer songs, I feel like it's made space in my brain to start writing again. Mm. And so I've started writing a couple songs that, that feel like, you know, the things I've experienced in the last few months, um, they, I guess I've digested them enough and they've settled in enough that I can now do the taffy regurgitation <laughs> and, and put it on paper and put some music to it. So, oh, that's yeah, great. nothing crazy or like giant goals, but, um, that's, but that's, you know what, that's, yeah. uh, you're just keeping it real and, and moving yeah. one step at a time. So. Nothing nearly as big as like affordable housing and healthcare for all the musicians. Well, but maybe <laughs> maybe that will be the next step. Let's get March that might on be. Longmont. That um, might be. I don't know. Something I care about at least. Well, let's see. We already we already talked. I guess basically the last question is going to be. Um, I was going to ask you if there's anything else that you wanted to promote. You already did. Ah. you got your show yep. and your your album coming up. So. Um, but just, is there anything else that you want to talk about? Yeah. Um, probably the last thing is I have decided not to really put out any CDs. Mm -hmm. I'm putting everything on Patreon. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. So a few things kind of shaped this decision. Um, but I, I really felt like with the Prairie Scholars, you know, being the booking promotion marketing person that I really need to push it and like generate interest and then as that came to a close and other things in my life came to a close I kind of had this theme that seemed to last for about a year of break the illusion you know I really needed to to let go of things that I was projecting a certain picture of what it was when it was really something else and I really just needed to let that go and so my decision to only put my music on Patreon was kind of that. It was like, if people are actually interested in my music, they'll decide 
to get it. Mm. You know, I don't have to force it on them. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, I've been pleasantly surprised to have people sign up for it. Um, I put new music on there every month, whether it's like a live recording or a demo of a new song or maybe just an instrumental piano song or um, maybe a video of the band that I didn't share in a public forum or mm-hmm. put it on YouTube. Um, and I, I just kind of decided to do that as um, almost a test of myself of like, yeah, I like doing music, but do people care about it at all? And just like break the illusion for myself. Hmm. And I found that, yeah, people do care, which hmm. was really encouraging. That is so, encouraging. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that's where, that's where all my new songs can be found. Fantastic. So, yeah. So what's, uh, um, was it just patreon.com slash Jessica Carson or how, how is that? Clandestine Amigo. Yep. Clandestine Amigo. Yep. Course, yeah. okay. And if you just go to Patreon, there's a little search engine and you can type in Clandestine Amigo. Okay. And there's... <laughs> There, there are tiers from one dollar to fifty dollars, and mm-hmm. the reason I did fifty dollars is because um, I had put a twenty dollar tier in there, thinking nobody's gonna sign up to give me twenty dollars uh-huh. a month. And then, like, a, a bunch of people did, which I thought was weird. And I was, I was kind of testing it, like, for fifty dollars, you get all this stuff, and I'll hang out with you for like coffee or lunch <laughs> once a month. Because if you're that invested, <laughs> I really want to meet you. And somebody signed up for it. So I have like a, a standing hangout with a lady that has turned out to be one of my best friends and like, oh my gosh, she's, she's a role model for me. Like wow. she's an extremely kind person, mm-hmm. very caring. I mean, she takes care of herself and has like healthy boundaries, but in that healthy boundary, she's able to take care of so many people around her and really spread so much love in the world and I think she's probably around 60 and I just hope in 30 years I have not become jaded and I can be like her Mm. (laughs) she's like she's a really incredible person that's fantastic yeah so patreon patreon all the music is housed yeah all right well Jessica it has been an absolute pleasure just talking with you this afternoon it has been fun thank you so much for dropping by why have we not done this before it's fun talking to you well we'll we'll have to do it again (laughs) so I'll I'll put my fifty dollars down give that coffee there you go right on alright alright thank you so much for tuning in be sure to catch Clandestine Amigo live sometime soon visit clandestineamigo.com for more info Be sure to check back in on next month's featured artist. And if you're interested in learning more about SoundBridge Music and becoming a part of Music for Change, check us out at soundbridgemusic.org.